to Rohit for organizing this really interesting panel and getting all of us who are working on Himachal uh, to uh, listen to each other's work. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, my broader question that I'm going to start with is, what do construction of national identity as a cultural process, uneven development as an economic and social process, and migration as a spatial process have in common? My work is an attempt to understand these processes as they come together in the lives of seasonal circular migrants from the states of Jharkhand, UP, Bihar, and also Nepal, who travel every summer to work for the border roads organization in the upper reaches of the Himalayas. The idea is to expand the understanding of circular migration from a mere movement of bodies in space to a flow of ideas, meanings, and identities in and through place. The idea also is to see the road not only as a material entity drawn on an abstract landscape, but as a symbol of technological nationalism, a material object that contributes towards a discursive construction of the nation. Of course, the roads materially also connect the nation, um, bringing different parts of uh, the nation uh, together. Uh, and they also mark borders. But the, and they also enable citizens and resources to move from one point of the nation um, and travel to another. And this is, these are boats that you find dotting all over the landscape um, in the border areas uh, where the BRO is working. Uh, the top creating, connecting, and caring for the nation is from the BRO website. And uh, roads are a signature of modern India, um, which also allude to the argument that I'm making, um, are from uh, the Ministry of Roads and Transport. So interestingly, these roads that we are going to be talking about are worked on by the Border Roads Organization, but the budget comes from the Ministry of uh, Surface Transport. So it's kind of military work which is funded by a civilian bu uh, budget. <coughs> The, uh, in order to understand these dimensions, I have been studying the work of BRO. The BRO is a semi-military engineering agency that constructs critical infrastructure in the border areas. So Lahol Spiti, Kinnor, Ladakh, the Northeast, also Andamans, uh, they are done with that part now, for defense. In troubled interiors, uh, that is the so-called Naxal belts of Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Maharashtra, for increased legibility and mobility of the state and international locations, such as Bhutan, Myanmar, and Afghanistan for building strategic alliances. It was formed in the 1960s by the then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru to sew together the disparate pieces of a newly emerging and fragile nation state and to protect it from external exigencies. BRO employs more than 10,000 casual paid labor. They're called imported casual paid labor based, whether, based on whether their travel is paid by the BRO or casual paid labor if their travel is not paid by the BRO. Um, and this paper presents the journeys and narratives of these migrants simultaneously raising questions of national versus regional identity, development, and national defense versus human precarity and human development. I have been following the yearly reconstruction of the Indo-Tibetan border road and the Manali Leh Highway now for over four years. So the map is, uh, I'm sorry, not that clear, but you kind of see a loop um, in blue. Um, and that is, so you could either enter the Manali Leh, uh, the Indo-Tibetan border road from uh, Manali, cross over the Rotang, get into the Lahol Valley, cross over Kunzum, get into Spiti, um, and then come out in Kinnor through Shimla. Uh, do that loop, um, uh, or you could do it the other way around. So I've been kind of going around on that road and also the Manali Leh Highway, which for the most part is in Himachal, until very close to Leh, it um, enters uh, JNK. <coughs> so while these roads lie in the Lahol Spiti and Kinnor districts of Himachal Pradesh, I argue, um, so here maybe we have a different perspective, like you talked about the scale of Himachal as being very um, critical to understanding development. Um, I think that we need to look at, I mean, which you also said towards the end of your introduction, we also need to look at connections beyond Himachal Pradesh to understand development in Himachal Pradesh. So <clears throat> we need to look at uh, beyond borders of Himachal state in order to understand de development in Himachal. In a 2001 essay titled Globalization and the Spatial Fix, 
David Harvey argues that to see the world as partitioned, I'm, and I'm quoting him, to see the world as partitioned into geographical entities, each undergoing some kind of temporal process of development, he argues, has become somewhat of a liability. Okay? Also, the new mobilities paradigm encourages us to see movement as the normal way of being for most individuals, challenging the idea of migration as an aberration okay, in today's days and times. So we need to look more carefully at these approaches in the context even of studying development in so-called remote regions of Himachal, which you might otherwise assume is cut off or not very well connected. So for example, um, some of the villages that I've done long-term work in Uh, so, okay, is Nako in Kinnor here and Lot in the Lahol Valley over here, close to Kilong. Um, in both in both these villages, what I saw, and I think what was also talked about in the earlier presentation, is that even the locals have been migrating for several generations now. Uh, most of them, most of the people that I met from the local community also have been sent. They they send their children to school um, and college in Shimla, Chandigarh, uh, Kullu, um, and Delhi. Um, and um, uh, they themselves migrate in the winters. They have land holdings in the uh, lower altitudes, such as in Kullu or in Shimla, and so on and so forth. And um, if you don't just look at the locals, then uh, in the summer months, for example, this is a very sparsely um, inhabited area. Um, and. Uh, in the summer months when the BRO labor and other labor move into the region, then they, are a, they constitute a large percentage of the population um, of, um, of these districts um, in the summer months. Okay? Okay, so that's supposed to be an India map, which is not reading very well. Um, <laughs> um, it has, the boundaries have vanished, talked about, talking about borderlessness here. Um, <coughs> So my story of road building in Himachal begins in Jharkhand, particularly Dumka district, from where a majority of the migrant workers that I have spoken to belong. So I have been talking to uh, workers every year. I um, try to cross Rohtang sometime in May, as soon as the snow gets cleared, or is just about to get cleared, um, and spend uh, the summer months in the Lahol districts, uh, or on the Manali Leh Highway. And also I've done that once in Kinnor. Um, and then I spend the winter month, which is basically December, in Jharkhand. So this is kind of talking to the returning labor. Um, and uh, pretty much 90% of the people that I've spoken to have been from this one particular district called the Dumka district in Jharkhand, which was very intriguing to begin with until I found out that many years back in the 1960s when the army started recruiting for border roads labor, they would take a dholki and go dum 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 in Dumka villages calling for um, labor to come and then you know really treating them well at that time by paying them f uh, train fare and um, well somewhat uh, better salaries than they would get in Jharkhand and so on. A lot of that has changed now. They don't get the rail fare just because they have now become quite a surplus pool of labor and a whole chain of migration, seasonal migration has begun from those districts. <coughs> So villages in this otherwise densely populated district of Dumka in Jharkhand assume a very Spartan character in the months from May to November, when pretty much all able-bodied men leave for work elsewhere. This district also has a long history of migrating for um, Dhan ki Katai to West Bengal, um, where uh, now mostly women participate, uh, also men do, uh, but m a lot of men, uh, you know, uh, leave for the border roads work also, and also to be employed as construction labor elsewhere. So this is the kind of stories I get to hear when they talk about their uh, travel journeys. Um, one of them told me that uh, in May, in one, this is his perception, that there are 10,000 people in one coach, and a person who's standing remains standing, and a person who's sitting has to keep sitting for like three days, and you have to be carried over other people's heads to get to the bathroom. Um, so it's, you know, it's quite a narrative if when you get to hear of their travel stories um, also. <clears throat> now recruitment for the BRO happens uh, for the northern uh, sectors. It differs if you go to the northeast. I haven't done work there. Uh, in Nagrota near Jammu, Bhang near Manali, and in Shimla. Men in large numbers live out their lives in the open 
uh, sometimes for as long as a month as they await recruitment. In Marxist terms, these men will provide the labor that will add value to the bitumen and the tar, building roads in treacherous terrain that will become symbols of national development and defense. Yet, they themselves constitute merely what is called a surplus pool of labor, whose bodies are the only assets they own and bring to the market, and which will only be employed for long enough to extract use their usefulness until the process of injury, illness, and death overcame them. So that's the story that I want to build. I, I'm not going to be able to build all of this in this uh, time, but that's kind of what I'm working towards. <clears throat> it is argued that Harvey's concept of the spatial fix can help us in understanding labor migration. Harvey argues that capitalism is addicted to geographical expansion and in order to stave off its periodic crisis, it needs to find technological and spatial fixes. In this case, it means the movement of surplus labor from peripheral to core economies. In the case of these circular migrants, I, I argue, what one sees is not just a spatial fix, but somewhat of a double spatial fix. The state solves its problems of national defense and development by relying on uneven development within the nation state. Moreover, the seasonal migrants themselves um, work to enable labor productivity in two se uh, separate distinct spaces. So by constructing or reinforcing technological modernity in one place, which is Himachal in this case, while reproducing rain-fed agricultural dependency in other, because they are only there during the harvest season or the sowing season, and the rest of the times they leave. Okay. This migration is only possible because of a developmental gap between two regions such that the labor in question has a dual frame of reference. What this means is that the, while Himachal becomes the site of production, consumption is temporarily suspended. So all of them say that they're leading suspended lives. They will only start living when they get back home and especially displaced to be taken place in their home, uh, you know, uh, in Jharkhand. <clears throat> and so when we are, you know, celebrating the immense success of Himachal, uh, we also need to take into perspective that it relies on a very strongly uneven developmental geography within the nation state itself. <coughs> so <clears throat> although I rely on Harvey's notion of the spatial fix, I see it as trapped within a highly political economic framework which limits our understanding of processes such as migration and development. It, it helps us to understand one aspect of it, the economic aspect of it, but I think we need to really expand that, the idea of a spatial fix. It can do lot, uh, uh, much more. Its abstraction, I think, conceals its human ecological dimensions. It is therefore that I argue for paying attention to the narratives and discourses of and about migrant labor. Okay. So the labor travels and lives and works in gangs of approximately 40 men. These men, uh, so the BRO sends a, um, a recruitment letter to a, to a mate. Mate is the gang leader. Uh, and each mate will recruit about 40, uh, 30, 40, 50, whatever the number he's been specified to bring uh, from villages surrounding uh, his village. And, um, he will take care of the initial expenses, including the expenses of staying in uh, uh, the recruitment site. And, uh, and he will also be in charge of supervising their labor, apart from the BRO uh, personnel themselves. He gets the same amount, uh, technically he gets the same amount in salary as the BRO labor themselves. However, he makes money by taking cuts um, or making a pre um, you know, pre-discussed pre contract with the labor saying you'll get 25,000 for six months, even when he knows that the BRO will be paying them close to 8,000 per month. So that's the kind of um, structure that exists. Uh, so uh, each tent, for example, uh, each location houses about 40 to 30 men. This, this is a tent which has about 38 men uh, that are going to be living in this space for uh, the next four or five months. Uh, where, depending on the altitude, if you are, let's say, in the lower altitudes in Lahore, you can still afford to, you know, have a daily bath and wash your clothes in the weekend. But if you're living in the upper altitudes, then it becomes, those th even those things become a challenge because the only water available to you is that fresh uh, glacial water, uh, which is pretty cold. Um, and we're not going to get into stories of 
um, how men have died taking a bath in that water, but the, I can assure you there are many of those also. <clears throat> Uh, so, um, and in, in this particular tent, for example, there are men from bo uh, both the Hindu and Muslim, uh, two religions. Uh, there are men from different castes and tribes, none of them upper caste, but um, still, I mean, there are Santhalias and there are Pahadis, um, and there are other uh, lower, uh, tri uh, lower castes from Dumka district, and they all kind of inhabit the same space here, whereas back in Jharkhand, each one would have a different tola. Okay. <clears throat> Vinay Gidwani and Siva Ramakrishnan, in their paper titled Circular Migration in the Spaces of Cultural Assertion, consider the cultural aspects of seasonal labor migration and see emerging a form of rural cosmopolitanism. In fact, they have also asked the question whether circular migration provided the cement necessary to assemble national imaginations. We see from our narratives of the road builder a similar national cosmopolitanism uh, consensus emerging as they look beyond their narrow regional identities and imagine themselves as travelers. I mean, they, they often tell you stories of, uh, so how much money did you spend to come and travel over here? See, we, we are getting paid, and every year we go here and we go there, and they'll have travel stories from the Northeast to Goa to, um, you know, uh, Bangalore uh, to Ladakh, and like to pretty much all ends of the nation. And to them, you know, that represents a very national uh, consciousness. Um, also, they talk about how caste barriers break down while they're here, um, but then they kind of become relevant again the moment they're back home in, in their own spaces. <coughs> uh, however, in the BRO discourse, the identity of the labor is fixed as a tribal, okay? Uh, depending, doesn't matter whether you're a tribal or not. If you're coming from Jharkhand, you're a tribal. Um, and that also in a, in a very, um, you know, um, deterministic way. So populations that have controlled and disciplined are loyal and hardworking. Uh, uh, they are a loyal and hardworking force that is naturally designed to endure hard labor. You'll see that over and over again, that somehow these people are built, you know, to perform that hard labor. And nothing happens to them. But if let loose, they can, in quotations, eat you alive. The labor too articulates their vulnerability in a location far removed from their social networks. Uh, so, um, what you see here, like this was, uh, these three quotes are from uh, basically dis discussing a similar incident where uh, the labor were getting really agitated by the long recruitment process when they were having to wait out in the open um, and they were not getting clean water and so, uh, and then they found out that some mates were giving bribes to the BRO officer to get them, their gangs recruited first. So there was almost a rebellion building up. Um, at which point we questioned the BRO officer and he said, uh, how can you suggest that, you know, we'll uh, be, um, you know, taking cuts and all of that? Because if we do any such thing, these people, we are afraid of them, they'll eat us alive. And the same person actually in a different context tells us that, you know, when I ask them about injuries on site or deaths on site, uh, nothing happens to them, ma'am. They are like, you know, they're very strong people and we hire them because they're very loyal. Um, and then the uh, men themselves say that they're quiet and docile now, but if it was in their own social context, then they would act very differently towards uh, these people. <coughs> uh, so, um, also, the locals in Lahal Spiti and Kinnor have a schizophrenic relationship with the labor. During weekends and early mornings, they're often called to lend a hand in the fields. However, laborers' lack of access to or ownership of built space for everyday functions is resented. For example, the laborer needs to use the field for open defecation, streams for bathing and washing clothes. Okay, so uh, the locals really kind of talk about um, how, you know, so if you, find, if you find a laborer in a field either collecting firewood or openly defecating, they'll be shooed away and there's this whole discourse about them kind of spreading uh, dirt uh, and uh, all around. Uh, this is, that's an image of one of the houses we rented out for a month of a local, and those two are images of uh, the labor living in, on the side of the roads. And the roadside for living and sleeping. Uh, we were reprimanded by a landlady in Lot village for accepting a dinner invitation by a gang of laborers. The perception is that they are dirty and if drunk can be dangerous. On the other hand, the laborers felt that it was only the local Himachali men, including our landlady's husband, who had the luxury of consuming alcohol every day. So there are differing perspectives depending on whom you uh, speak to about the same incident. 
for the laborers their work on the road is their majboori and yet they are aware of the role in creating infrastructure critical for tourism and defense they also question why is the same effort not put into building roads in jharkhand how come every village in himachal has a school and health center when in jharkhand they are struggling for even basic amenities and if they are working towards the nation's defense then they are not then are they not its citizen i mean this is my favorite quote where this guy asks me so main bhi to hindustan hu fir meri hifazat kaun karega you know like i am also an indian who is there to protect me and i am working towards the nation's defense uh, so what about my defense you know so he i mean there is that consciousness and there is that you know awareness um where they talk about um, really their role in developing infrastructure and yet been completely forgotten and invisible in the whole process i mean we had this time we distributed journals and i had some of them really they wrote such touching poetry uh, revealing their uh, you know emotions and angst at the situation that they are stuck in <coughs> so in the end i conclude by saying that in this research i have attempted to bring the cultural politics in dialogue with a political economy framework so since the time was so short i have had to kind of consolidate this whole thing uh, but um, uh, <clears throat> and to present uh, development in himachal as a part of a politics of national development that is intimately tied to uneven development in the country also to reveal the contradictions in discourses of regional and national development and defense especially in relation to human precarity and ecological fragility so again i haven't spoken about ecological fragility but i mean the fact that uh, uh the what you need to do to build a road like put a dynamite break down paths uh and creates very precarious conditions both for the humans living there and for the mountain itself uh they most of them pitch their tents right next to the road and there are times when the the whole thing just comes down on them so it's a danger they are living with every day um okay so i'll end here uh, i would like to encourage you to go to a blog that one of our ras has just started which is documenting more the stories of the road builders uh, migrantlaborers.wordpress.com um and uh, we can take things up for questioning questions later Thank you.